Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm your host, Agas Ramirez. In this episode, we're going to meet Herb Bunag, a woman whose photographs give us a rare and important glimpse into the early 20th century Siamese royal court. And one, two, three, and one, two, three, and shall we done? One, two, three, and on a bright cloud of music shall we fly? One, two, three, and shall we done? One, two, three, and shall we then say good night and mean goodbye? One, two, three, and oh, oh perchance. When the last little star has leave the sky, shall we still be together? Christine Barth writes that while pioneering Western commercial photographers living and working in Asia produced a lot of so-called exotic images of local women, women in general remain invisible in the history of photography. Even in the first serious history of women photographers by Naomi Rosenblum, there are only two short paragraphs devoted to female practitioners in Asia. In fact, she only names one, Marie-Lydie Cabani Bonfil from France, wife of Félix Bonfil, with whom he worked in his studio in Beirut. Nisan N. Perez, in his book Focus East, names only two female photographers in Asia and North Africa besides Marie-Lydie Bonfil. They were Elizabeth Ann Finn and Miss Margaret Benson. Rosenblum says, and this is apparently true all over the world, most frequently, a woman would help her spouse in a photography business and then take it over after his death. As the techniques for producing photographs changed, women were called upon for retouching as well as coloring. This skill, taught in schools, remained women's work into the 19th century, perhaps because, as one writer put it in the mid-1880s, a woman skilled in retouching would have secured greater pay if she had been a man. So. That's very good commentary on how women's work nets lower pay across history. In some Asian countries, though, the real problem was that women were not allowed to be photographed by men. This gave rise to female photographers. In 19th century India, a unique feature in early photography was the establishment of the Senana, or women's studios, to accommodate the Indian custom that required women to be protected from the gaze of the unknown male photographer. Because Indian families desired photographs of their wives, daughters, and mothers, Senana Studios run by British female photographers were introduced. There are at least three pioneering Indian women photographers, Maharana Manmohini, third wife of the Maharaja of Tripura, Jana Danandini Devi, a member of the Tagore family, and Sarojini Ghosh, the first 19th century professional Bengali woman to open a studio. In Ceylon, today's Sri Lanka, there were three 19th century female photographers. Inez Maria Gibeo, born in Kutch, India, was the daughter of an Italian merchant who became known as Madame del Tufo, artist, photographer, and proprietress, and was active until the 1930s. Julia Margaret Cameron, born in Calcutta, India, was active until her death in 1879. And Ethel Partridge Kumaraswamy, who was born in the UK, but married art historian Ananda Kumaraswamy, with whom she co-authored the book Medieval Sinhalese Art, published in 1908. In both Persia and Siam, there were court women who could become amateur assistants and photographers as they were married to or the sister or daughter of a royal male. In Persia, there were sisters Fateme Sultan Kanom and Ozra Kanom, who photographed women and children with the latter being married to a court photographer. Ashraf al-Saltane, the wife of a minister, was a pioneer photographer in Persia. And Habibi Zaman and Azize Jahan, the daughters of the patriarch of the Chahernagar family of photographers in Shiraz, who opened the first women's studio there in 1928. In the case of Siam, still according to Barth, from the late 1890s onwards, royal women gained access to the same photographic technologies that were popular among the males. The activities of royal women were photographed almost exclusively by the consorts themselves. The best photographers among the consorts to King Chulalongkorn were the sisters Herb and Wen Bunag, who took photographs largely for his amusement and viewing up until the first decade of the 20th century. Chao Chom, royal consort Herb Bunag, is a rather unique historical figure. I'm happy to report that there are sources of information about her, although they're mostly academic. According to Leslie Castro Woodhouse, she was born on April 22, 1879, 
to a prominent family during Siam's fifth reign. The fifth reign under King Chulalongkorn lasted from 1868 to 1910. But the Bunag clan was particularly prominent both at court in Bangkok and in local political life long before this. Herb's uncle, Chuang Bunag, had been one of King Mongkut's highest ranking ministers. After the king's death in 1868, he served as regent for Prince Chulalongkorn until he came of age in 1872. Thus, her uncle effectively ruled the kingdom for four years. Herb's father, Tet, was governor of the family's home province of Pechaburi. The Bunag women, on the other hand, had been linked maritally to the Siamese royal family since the later 16th century, during the Ayutthaya era. By the 19th century, the Bunag family was very strongly represented among the king's concubines. Among the 153 royal consorts of Chulalongkorn, 15 came from the Bunag family and 7 were Tet Bunag's daughters. Royal consorts perform a very important function of enacting kinship between the palace inside and the provinces and vassal states outside. This ensured the loyalties of Siam's nobles and tributary polities and, to some extent, the citizens themselves. Of these seven, five were known as Kok O, or the O clique. They were five sisters born to Tet and his wife, Lady O, between 1868 and 1887. Lady O was the highest-ranking wife who lived with a total of 29 consorts in Pechaburi. They were called the O clique because their names all began with the same letter, their mother's first initial, the Thai letter O. Herb's eldest sister, On, was the first to become a royal consort in 1885. When she gave birth in 1886, she received her own residence at Wat Prakyao, the Grand Palace in Bangkok, and her sister Yem became her lady-in-waiting. Herb joined them in 1891, and Ab arrived in 1894. The youngest, Wen, would become a consort in 1904. They all lived in the inner palace, the section of the palace reserved for the king's consorts, their ladies-in-waiting, and their children, which was forbidden to outsiders, and also men. If you want to know more about the workings of the inner palace, we have a bonus episode on Maying Tafan and the Krom clone which touches on this. In 1897, the kinship ties created by royal concubinage were changed with the adoption of a Western-style, rational system of administrative bureaucracy in the provinces. So the political role of the consorts declined, but their public visibility increased because of, you guessed it, photography. The king's passion for photography was shared by many other Siamese elite males, but few know that photography was also practiced by a number of the king's concubines and female children as well. Herb Bunag was a prominent consort despite not bearing any children. The Auklik were among the first to stay in the first royal pavilion at Dusit Park in March 1899. The sisters were appointed to special positions within the king's entourage. Herb and her sisters An and Yam accompanied him to Java in 1901 and Singapore in 1906, for example. When the king moved to Viman Mek Mansion at Dusit Park in 1902, Herb's sleeping quarters were relocated to the chamber adjacent to both the king's bedroom and wardrobe closet on the third floor. She was placed in charge of several special events at the palace, such as the state visit of a Shan princess from Burma in 1906. She was never promoted any higher than the rank of royal consort or Chao Chom, but her duties improved her standing within the palace. In the late 1890s, royal women gained access to photography. The landscapes visible in the majority of the pictures of palace women suggest that they were taken on the grounds of Dusit Park between 1901 and 1910. They chronicled the activities of the sisters and other high-status consorts. These showed them in picnics and outdoor meals, bathing in the klongs, and even photographing each other. Again, the activities of royal women were photographed almost exclusively by the consorts themselves. The photos are fascinating. I was taken aback by this one photo of Herb, circa 1905, as she's taking a photo of her father, Tet. Tet's back is against a tree, and Herb is standing in front of an accordion camera on a tripod. But she's looking straight at us, through another camera photographing the scene, as if breaking the fourth wall on their inner lives. She seems to almost be winking at the second camera, as if to say, Just a day in the life. Come look. Other photos, and these are available on Patreon, depict the sisters' lives, 
working in the king's Dusit Palace kitchen, picking fruit from trees at Dusit, sharing a meal on the veranda of the king's residence. Lady Ab, the fourth sister, was said to be a talented cook, and she's photographed in her element in the kitchen of the Rowenton residence. It's important here to note how the all click looked in their casual photographs. We'll contrast this with formal photographs later. Maurizio Pileggi, in Refashioning Civilization, Dress and Bodily Practice and Thai Nation Building, describes their form of dress very accurately. Quote, Ordinary dress for both sexes consisted of a single garment, a length of cotton, fanung, that was wrapped around the waist. At court, the fanung was of silk rather than homespun cotton cloth and was wrapped in the shape of pantaloons or chongkaben. In villages and even towns, it was common for women to go around bare-breasted, but female courtiers wore a loose wrap, sabai, around their torsos. Both men and women cropped their hair, keeping only a tuft on the crown, and their teeth were stained black from chewing betel, arica leaves, a natural stimulant, a habit that was widespread across social strata, unquote. You can see a photo of Wen with her teeth stained black in a photo where she's laughing. Besides Herb, other well-known photographers were actually her sister Wen and nieces Ora Prapun Rampai and Adisai Suriyafa, who were her eldest sister, Ons, daughters. Herb took photos of other people outside her family too, of course. In fact, some of these photos of domestic palace life have become familiar to the Thai viewing public at large over the decades. We'll talk about those after the break. You've heard of the terms colonization or decolonization in bits and pieces. But do you find European colonization too broad and too complicated to get into? Well, there is now a podcast for you. Join me, Fidelity, on an introduction through the history of colonization. We will cover not just the major wars and conquests that took place, but also the perspectives of people who have been neglected in the grand Eurocentric narrative of discovery in colonial lands. You can find the History of Colonization podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Princess Dararasami is seated in a wooden chair, her left hand draped across its back as she looks at the camera. Her long hair that reaches the rug under her bare feet is reflected on two European-style mirrors. She's wearing a European-style stitched blouse and a tubular textile skirt known as fasin. To her right is a dressing table filled with cosmetic and perfume bottles, as well as a candlestick. The scene is completely staged, there's a plain backdrop that conceals the shoot being outdoors. You can see the trees in the mirror. Earlier, I described how the all click looked. Contrast that now with Dada Rasami, whose strikingly long hair and use of textiles immediately mark her as foreign. She, in fact, hailed from the kingdom of Lanna, which at the time was already under Siamese rule. Ethnically, she was considered Lao. Woodhouse writes that in Dara Rasami's clan, a woman wore the textile pattern and garment styles of her hometown, even if she married or relocated. This acknowledged her matrilineal clan and placated their spirits. When noble women of Lao or Lanna kingdoms were sent as consorts, they brought their textile traditions with them. This shows us, the onlookers, the reach of the ruler's territory. Thus, she continued to look different for both cultural and political reasons. Dada Rasami deserves a separate discussion, so we'll take her up in a bonus episode. Mary Ellen Snodgrass writes, quote, Within the enclosed space, Herb developed the Victorian fad of photography practiced by 153 harem artisans, including the royal children, Wen, and nieces Ora Prapun Rampai and Adisai Suriyafa. Herb's images, such as the seated figure of Dara Rasami, a Lao native, dramatist, letter writer, and actor from Lanna to the North, captured an upswept hairstyle with ornaments, lacy blouse, and traditional patterned skirt accessorized with jewelry, velvet neck ribbon, and fan. 
The combination exhibited the influence of Victorian English women's comportment and styles on Siamese fashion and the opening of the secluded inner palace to admit outside viewers. Herb's insightful photos of Bangkok women suggest the ease of an aristocrat long acknowledged in Siamese society and politics. At a time when European colonizers considered annexing Siam, Thais accepted and imitated the culture and tastes of the outside world, especially command of the English language, writing, dance, drama, and other avocations. At a time when European colonizers considered annexing Siam, Thais accepted and imitated the culture and tastes of the outside world, especially command of the English language, writing, dance, drama, and other avocations, unquote. Besides Dada Rasami, she also took photos of other royal women like Lady Kanomdom Amatyakul using a sewing machine at Viman Mac Mansion. Urbunag also took a very famous photo of King Chulalongkon that's very unlike his former photographs. In this one, his upper body is bare. He's only wearing a loosely wrapped lower garment called a fa kao ma. It's an outfit which could be worn by any Siamese commoner. Woodhouse writes, his pose is casual and unguarded. The king is shown sitting on a chair as he bends intently over a walk, staring it with his right hand while he smokes a cigar or cheroot with his left. The overall scene has a relaxed and contemplative feeling, as if one is present with a king in an intimate domestic moment. It is unsurprising that this photo is frequently seen today in restaurants throughout Thailand, in the area of the shop reserved for venerating an image of the king, past or present." Unquote. You can start to see here just how important the politics of dress was to the court. Herb's casual photographs showed a different side of life compared to the formal photographs. It's really very important to understand the politics of dress during this time period. The 1870s to the 1920s were a period of change in Thailand. As Heidi Brevik Sender writes, dress in Herb's pictures can be instructively contrasted with the attire and official court photographs of female royalty during this time and can be especially revealing of evolutions in the period's gendered politics of appearance. In 1904, the annual temple fair at Wat Ben Chama Bofit, the Marble Palace, featured a temporary photo booth signaling the transition of photography from something Siamese royalty did largely for their own amusement and viewing to something the general public could enjoy. Naturally, the booth was very popular with fair attendees. The following year, in 1905, the fair featured a photography contest and exhibition. This major social event was attended by thousands of people. Herb was a key figure in this contest. She intensified her photographic activity around the palace, which resulted in a high volume of her photographs which remain in the archive. A total of 123 photographers, including some Europeans, participated in this event. Among the 395 works submitted, almost half were by members of the royal family. A newspaper article published around this time listed the names of the event's supporters. The group in charge of arranging the photography exhibit itself was the Division of Photography, which had both Erbunag and Dara Rasami, along with one of the king's elder brothers, who was well known for his photographic experience. This is significant because there is a clear alignment with younger royals here with the aim of the establishment to siwalai, to become civilized. The word siwalai itself is a transliteration from the English. Herb exhibited many of her photographs here, including those of Dada Rasami. According to Woodhouse, Dada Rasami's presence at Dusit Palace provided Herb with easy access to a rare and exotic foreign subject, a Lao woman rarely seen in Bangkok. That Dara Rasami opted to participate in the photography contest signals her general support of photography. Sitting for Herb's camera was likely a small favor to her friend. Nonetheless, the ways in which Herb posed and shot her subject provide insight into the Siamese view of Dara Rasami's difference. Eventually, Herb and her sisters received a royal grant of land adjacent to Viman Mek Palace in the Dusit district on which to build their own residence. This was called the Outer Garden, where they lived after the king died on October 23, 1910. As far as we know, Herb Bunag passed away on August 11, 1944, at the age of 65, and her remains lie in the Royal Cemetery of Bangkok. Her sister, An, lived in the Outer Garden for 26 more years until her death in 1970, at the age of 102.
As an aside, last February, the Royal Society of Thailand, known as the National Academy, which regulates the proper use of Thai language for literature, announced the change of the official name of Thailand's capital from Bangkok to Kongtep Mahanakon, City of Angels. It's actually only the first part of the city's much longer full name, and I'm probably going to say this incorrectly, but I'm going to do this as a challenge, so here goes. Krongtep Mahanakon, Amon Ratanakosin, Mahintara Ayutea, Mahadilokbop, Naparat Rachatathani Borirom, Udom Rachaniwet Mahasatan, Amon Piman Awatan, Satitsa Katatia Witsanukam Prasit. Let me know how I did. This is said, and I totally believe this, to be the world's longest place name and is occasionally used in rituals at the Grand Palace. It gives that Welsh place name a run for its money. Now, I won't even attempt that, so here's a clip of a reporter saying the name. Parts of eastern England with cloudy skies, but in the sunshine in northwest Wales at RAF Mona, just up the road from Clanbyr Pushwing, Gogedequin Drobo, Clanticilio Gogogog, the temperature got to 21 Celsius at 70 in Fahrenheit. To recap, we learned in this episode, first, how crucial the role was that the women of the Inner Siamese Palace played in national political affairs. Second, how many of them, like Herb Bunag and her sisters, also known as the All Click, also participated in artistic production. Third, how they expressed themselves through hairstyle and dress that carried their heritage. And fourth, how they carried out the Siwilai, or the civilizing mission of the monarchy, at the turn of the century. I guess the most striking thing for me is how contemporary Urbunag looks in that photo on the cover, where she's breaking the fourth wall. I keep thinking about how rich their inner lives were and how lucky we are that she managed to capture a little bit of it. That's it for episode 20, Urbunag's photographs of early 20th century Siam. Watch out for the bonus episode on Dada Rasami, which should be up on Patreon in a couple of days. If you want more her story, Head on over to the Patreon for the bonus episodes on Nyage de Pinate, the harbor master of Gresik, an interview with Haldi Patra on the Minangkabao Matriarchal Society, Maying Tafan and the Calm Clone, Queen Sariatai and the War Elephants, Paz Marquez Benitez and Dead Stars, and the rise and fall of the Achenese Queens, 1641 to 1699. As always, thank you to our patrons, Kero, Xiaomi Bibay Milish, Jennifer, Christina, Raul, Raymond, Chito, Matt, Ashley, Shireen, Charlie, Chanda, Yati, Kara, and Mando. If you want to join the Patreon, you can give as little as $1 to get a copy of the show notes with all the references, a shout-out at the end of the next episode, and access to all the bonus episodes. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at HerStoryCPod. That's HerStory, S-E-A-Pod. There are so many more stories to tell, and we're just getting started. This podcast was hosted and edited by Agus Ramirez. Thank you for listening and we hope to see you again next time. Sampai jumpa lagi!